Good morning, our saviors. It is so nice to see you today. It's very nice to see you. Good to see so many people, not only in the pews, but also Tim is back. You noticed he wasn't here last Sunday. He and Lisa were traveling far and wide, and they have returned from their far journeys and uh, are back in town, and he's ready to, he's raring to deliver a really fantastic sermon for you. I know it's a 10 out of 10, so be excited. Uh, so they're back, and they're rejoicing uh, for several reasons, and i um, very happy for them. Uh, good to see you on this, uh, on this holiday weekend. I remember on Friday, my wife and I were sitting outside in the nice cool of the day, and I say, Chelsea, it's my wife, Chelsea, do you want to grill out today, maybe tomorrow? And she goes, oh, no, I was thinking we'd wait till Sunday. I said, oh, why? Is there something special about Sunday? Oh, yeah, it's the Lord's Day. She rolled her eyes at me, which is kind of the normal response for a person like me. Uh, <laughs> so welcome to worship. I'm happy to see you. Uh, let's continue worship with confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the God of manna, the God of miracles, the God of mercy. Drawn to Christ and seeking God's abundance, let us confess our sin. God, our provider, help us. It is hard to believe there is enough to share. We question your ways when they differ from the ways of the world in which we live. We turn to our own understanding rather than trusting in you. We take offense at your teachings and your ways. Turn us again to you. Where else can we turn? Share with us the words of eternal life and feed us for life in the world. Amen. Beloved people of God, in Jesus, the manna from heaven, you are fed and nourished. By Jesus, the worker of miracles, there is always more than enough. And through Jesus, the bread of life, you are shown God's mercy. You are forgiven and loved into abundant life. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. God of the covenant, in our baptism you call us to proclaim the coming of your kingdom. Give us the courage you give the apostles that we may faithfully witness to your love and peace in every circumstance of life. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. First reading is from Ezekiel. A voice said to me, O mortal, stand up on your feet and I will speak with you. And when he spoke to me, a spirit entered into me and set me on my feet, and I heard him speaking to me. He said to me, Mortal, I am sending you to the people of Israel, a nation of rebels who have rebelled against me. They and their ancestors have transgressed against me to this very day. The descendants are impudent and stubborn. I am sending you to them, and you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Whether they hear or refuse to hear, for they are a rebellious house, they shall know that there has been a prophet among them. The word of the Lord. We'll read Psalm 123 responsively. To you I lift up my eyes, to you enthroned in the heavens. The eyes of the servants look to the hand of their masters, and the eyes of a maid to the hand of her mistress. So our eyes look to you, O Lord, God, until you show us your mercy. Have mercy on us, O Lord, have mercy, for you have had more than enough of contempt. Too much of the scorn of the indolent rich and of the derision of the proud.
for the reading of the Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to Mark, the sixth chapter. Jesus came to his hometown and his disciples followed him. On the Sabbath he began to teach in the synagogue and many who heard him were astounded. They said, where did this man get all this? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Then Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without honor, except in their hometown and among their own kin and in their own house. And he could do no deed of power there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Then he went about the villages teaching. He called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. And he ordered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. He said to them, Wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place. If any place will not welcome you and they refuse to hear you, as you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that all should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, you may be seated. So personal point of privilege for today, he's here. So I know you can't see it, but Mubsy arrived yesterday. My daughter will be married at the end of this month, so um, that's pretty exciting news for us in our household, and uh, they're coming to our house today, so I get to see my future son-in-law in a few hours, which is great. So it might be a segue, a good segue, a little bit into what we're going to talk about today, which is about expectations. In many uh, respects, I want you to think about what is, it, what is it that you are expecting? What do you expect out of God is the first question I want to ask you this morning. What do you expect from God? Now, in, in order to set up this story, it's really important to see it in its own context. In Mark's story, the previous chapter, uh, chapter 5, has some incredible things, uh, stories that you uh, heard read uh, last week. The story of Jairus' daughter being uh, healed and the woman with uh, hemorrhage. Those stories are incredible stories of healings that people witnessed. And as people witnessed Jesus doing these healings in remarkable ways, you can imagine... um, the, the aura around him. You can imagine the reputation that uh, went before him as he uh, moved about uh, from town to town. And as he comes to his uh, hometown of Nazareth, there is an expectation about what they will see. What is it that they will witness from this Jesus? There is some sense of surprise and awe, as you can imagine, Coming back to your hometown, I've said before, the first time I preached at my, the, the church that I grew up in, in West Allis, um, it was kind of a, 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 the most difficult sermon I've ever had to preach because I knew that at that time, I mean, it was many years after I'd been there, obviously, but there were a ton of people sitting out in those pews that when they looked up to the front, uh, to the pulpit, and they saw me standing, they did not see me. You know, they saw little Timmy. Right? And they remembered all the stupid things I did as a kid. So it was, it was not only did I have to preach the word that was uh, given to us to, uh, to say that day, but there was that sense of, you know, you had to cut through all this other stuff, right, in order for them to hear what they had to hear. Um, so the expectations were maybe different from what I had. To, to bring to that home congregation and from what they had of me. Another uh, th- thought about expectation and someone coming home, there was a kid uh, who uh, 
was a fantastic athlete in high school in a church that I served uh, previously, a uh, small town in Minnesota, and um, he was multi-sport, uh, went to won state tournaments in basketball and tennis, uh, played uh, football, was a fantastic tight end, got recruited uh, by um, uh, a coach at Notre Dame, uh, was given full ride scholarship to play Notre Dame, got drafted, was the second pick in the second round in the NFL draft and played for the uh, Seattle Seahawks for a number of years. Um, ended up going back to his home team, the Vikings, for a couple, ended up in Phoenix uh, with the Cardinals. But he, um, you know, his career wasn't super long, maybe, I don't know, seven, eight years or whatever. But as, as when he would come town, his parents were high school teachers. And when he would come back to town, people, it was like their eyes got huge, you know, and, and they couldn't believe it that this kid was back in town. He's an NFL player, right? He was like, they, 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 it was, they were in awe. I think he was like the, the water, watercade parade marshal for a year or two because, you know, he was like this bigger-than-life person, you know, they'd come out of this little town to play football. All the expectations that they had for him, you know, were uh, pretty amazing. So you can imagine in this little town of Nazareth, which was a small town in Jesus' day, it was just, you know, a little village that supported the workers who worked in Sepphoris, which was the big uh, Roman city next door. Um, you can imagine as Jesus comes back home, all the expectations after hearing about the miracles that he's performing they were so excited to imagine what was going to happen. And as they were recalling this and people were imagining how it is that Jesus could be this, they also started remembering his roots. And so as they were uh, seeing him come into town and they were amazed at the things that he had done, they were super amazed because they knew that he was born of Mary and Joseph. He grew up in a carpenter's family, a worker who had worked in Sepphoris, you know, someone that just sort of made it by. He wasn't born into royalty. He wasn't born into the priesthood, right? That, that there was a certain sense of you were born into a certain role in society and that's how things would play out in your life. If you were lucky, you were born into a higher kind of caste or echelon and uh, most people weren't that lucky. And so as they imagined this, this Jesus coming back home after performing all these incredible miracles and hearing the stories and the crowd of people that followed him as he walked into town, there was this conflict in their, in their hearts. What could this Jesus be? Who is he really? If he is this Jesus, son of Mary and Joseph and brother of these siblings, how could it be that he has uh, these, these incredible powers? It's ridiculous. And at some point, they kind of said, nah, this can't be. And it says, Mark says, they took offense at him. He was more than what they had expected. It's similar to a lot of, a lot of, things uh, that happen to people who step out of their comfort zone, that are called into, into ministry and into things that are different than what maybe people had expected uh, for them to do. Uh, for instance, the Apostle Paul, who was a persecutor of the church. He was born and raised in a system where he was to be a, a Pharisee of, of, uh, of high standards. He would say in one of his letters that there wasn't a Pharisee that was more a Pharisee than him. That he, that's who he was born to be. And he was the one who was persecuting those followers of the way until one day he is blinded by the light, confronted by Jesus, and who says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And his life changed in that moment. He began to become a proclaimer of God's message to the people, a message that was seen as scandalous. Or take Ezekiel the prophet that you heard Steve read today. God gives the call to Ezekiel. 
but he also gives him the power to proclaim a message that people don't want to hear. They don't want to hear what Ezekiel has to say because they don't want to hear a God who is this God of the message. Paul boasts beyond his, about his life, but not pointing to himself, but beyond him to this incredible news of a God who loves the whole world. Not just simply if you are lucky enough to be born into power, or born into privilege, but God loves the whole world. God loves those who seem to be unlovable. All of Paul's life, both the good and bad, are encompassed by a God of love. So again, I ask you the question, what do you expect from God? Because I don't know that our expectations are any different from those who heard Jesus speak in Nazareth on that day or heard the Apostle Paul or even going back uh, to the Old Testament who heard Ezekiel. What do you expect from God? What do you expect God to do? Are we any different? Do we like God kind of neat and tidy? Sometimes I think we like to be entertained, right? I mean, we become a culture that has to be entertained. It used to be when we were uh, younger that, uh, you know, there may be three networks, well, maybe four. So let's see, CBS, ABC, NBC, and PBS, right? There were four networks, uh, and now I can't count how many networks, how many TV, zillions, yeah, unlimited, right? We are, have become a culture that needs to be entertained. We have to be entertained. We turn on the TV. We turn on our phones. We were on Madeline Island this week, and I got mad because my cell service would, would sort of toggle between no service and one bar, right? And I'd be sitting in my hammock or laying in my hammock, and it was so beautiful up there on the island. It was, I can't tell you how beautiful it was, 75 and sunny every day, you know, and oh, I'd get to be maybe close to 80 one day, and I'd have to make the trek to the beach on Big Bay State Park and kind of wade in Lake Superior, you know. It was a tough week for me, <laughs> right? I had to be entertained at that moment, swinging in my hammock, and I was mad because it would go from one bar to no bars, one bar to... We have to, if it's not on our phones or our TV sets or on our computers, we're lost. I heard these kids at the campsite across, the parents trying to get the kids to turn their phones off and leave them because they wanted to go to the beach, and the kids said, but I don't get service at the beach. <laughs> Can you imagine that if you were like, do you remember when you were a kid? Before there were actually cell phones? Do, do you know there was a time when there weren't cell phones? <laughs> and, and, and you actually like would go outside and just figure out something to do. You remember that? Sometimes I long for that, right? Sometimes I long for that, but I have to admit that I get pretty tied to that phone on my hip. So what do we expect from God? Do we expect that we are to be entertained? So we come to church to be entertained, and we've built a culture like that, and in fact, to be honest, we built a church like that. The Christian church suffers today because we've made it into an entertainment spectacle. So we make our church services to try to be as entertaining as possible so that people come to church to hear what they want to hear and we hope that they come back and we hope that they support our churches. And so you, for like in the 90s, you saw the rise of the mega church. Anybody hear of that? The mega church. So they built these huge churches all around. We have some around us in uh, Madison, in the Madison area, right? Where they build these huge churches where they have playgrounds inside the churches or coffee shops that are inside the churches. So you can go and they'll make a latte for you so you can sit down in your comfortable chair in church and listen to a band. You don't really have to sing unless you know the music, but you can just sit back and relax. And it's not just non-denominationals. I mean, I remember going to Community Church of Joy in uh, Phoenix, Arizona, uh, 10, 20 years ago, and I didn't have to do one thing in that church service. Even the prayers, they said, we don't do prayers. You can pray if you want to out with, in a prayer chapel after the service. Because, you know, if you had to pray, then you had to, you know, then you were participating. 
we don't want you to participate, we just want you to be entertained, right? And the pastors would come up, get this, they had Armani suits and manicures. Can you imagine that? And they sat in the front, you know, and boy, they looked, they were sweet, they looked, their hair was coughed perfectly. This was an ELCA church, one of the fastest growing ELCA churches in the time, right? Entertainment culture, we love to be entertained. What do we expect from God? Entertain us, right? Entertain us. Or how about this? Maybe we, uh, we wonder about an expectation of God that it just stays away until I need him, right? So we say, you know, just, just don't bother me. Let me live my life. But if I need you, you know, I'll pray hard, and then you come, and it's sort of like God as a Pez dispenser, right? You ever, maybe you guys aren't old enough to remember Pez dispensers, right? I don't know. Kina, do you remember, do you know what a Pez dispenser is? Okay, that's good. You know, and we think that somehow, we, if we just pray enough or we give enough, you know, then God will answer our prayer. And so we expect that God will just do for us what we want. So, you know, we live our life the way we want to live it, and then when we need God, we give God prayers or we contribute more to the church, and then God will answer our prayers. And if God doesn't answer our prayers, then we get mad at God. But we don't want to really get mad at God because we're worried that if we get mad at God, then the next time God won't answer our prayer either because we were mad at God. Right? And we get caught up into this. And so our expectations become, you know, that we have separate lives. So we have our life here, and then there's this God thing that happens. And when we need God, we want God, but I don't really want God around. I don't want God to see what I'm doing. And so, you know, we'll just leave it separate. So our expectation is, leave me alone, God, unless I need you. All right? How does, that, how does that give you life? Where is the life in that? Do you think that's what Jesus is about in his ministry as he comes to his hometown? Maybe there's another question that we need to ask today, and that is, what do we expect of ourselves? Maybe that's an appropriate question, because how often is our life about a mad dash through it running away from the past and trying to catch the future. We're always looking forward to something that I can grab onto down the road. Like, I don't want to live or exist in the, in the now. I, I need to catch something in the future. And so we're always running away from something. And the question for us becomes, how do we become captured by the now so that we can expect something from life and ourselves right now, not down the road. God's presence in Jesus, the kingdom has come to Nazareth. Mark begins his gospel. Jesus begins his ministry by bringing the kingdom with him. So the kingdom has come to Nazareth, to his hometown. But the people didn't expect it, and they didn't see it. They lost the wonder of the presence of God in their midst in that moment because they didn't expect it in this Jesus of Nazareth. And so I ask you this morning, what do you expect of God and what do you expect of yourself? Do you expect to see God this morning in that little bit of juice and bread that you will eat in a little bit? Do you ex expect that God comes in the gift of community that's sitting around you this morning or that is on, online with us this morning or, or comes uh, in the midst of prayers around us this morning? Do you expect the gift of the presence of God in this moment of hearing God's Word? And if you do, then what do you expect to do with that moment? to do with this moment, to do with the bread and wine, to do with Jesus' presence that you ingest today. Maybe it might be helpful just to begin with something as simple as open your eyes. Open your eyes, and what do you see? All of us sitting here this morning, we're all sinners. Nobody's perfect. 
We all look inward to our own best interests and try to turn away from God. Maybe not necessarily because we think we are, because, but because we're so caught up into a culture of me at the center. So maybe if we opened our eyes this morning and saw God at work among us, God gathering us, the Holy Spirit kicking us out of bed this morning and bringing us here today, that together we hear this, this incredible news that we are forgiven for a life that continues to turn away and then given opportunities and expectations to live for God and for our neighbor. God works through the everyday common occurrences in our lives. God affirms our jobs and occupations and gives us vocations, calling us to serve God in whatever station we are at and to see the joy of God's presence that comes to us beyond our expectations as a gift. And so really, what do you expect? A God who is present, a God who is here, right now, and a God who will continue to walk with us as we journey into God's good future. May you live in it, and may you share it. Amen. Let us come before the triune God in prayer. God of all, through the waters of baptism you claim people of all races, ethnicities, and languages as your beloved children. Sustain the baptized and increase their faith that your gospel may be proclaimed throughout the earth. Lord, in your mercy. God of the heavens, your creating spirit animates the universe. We give you thanks for the moon and stars, for the planets and the Milky Way galaxy, and for all of the mysteries of the cosmos that remain unknown to us. Lord, in your mercy. God of freedom, you have liberated us from sin and death and rescue us from all forms of spiritual, social, and political oppression. 
Defend us from tyrants in our midst and deliver us from all forms of slavery or corruption. Direct our freedom for works of liberation and wholeness. Lord, in your mercy. God of compassion, you become vulnerable in the person of Jesus Christ in solidarity with the disempowered. Strengthen those who feel faint, give courage to those who fear, and bring wholeness to those in need, especially Dale, Chris, John, Susan, Wesley, Krista, Roxy, and the family of James as they mourn his death this week. Lord, in your mercy. God of holiness, you send us out into the world to proclaim your love. We pray for our outreach ministries, especially Sunshine Supper, as they make sure all in our community are fed. Equip us as we leave this place to witness and serve our neighbors. Lord, in your mercy. We give you thanks that in every time and place you call forth prophets who move us towards freedom. Thank you for those who work for human rights, community, organizers, and all who strive for liberty for all. Lord, in your mercy. We lift our prayers to you, O God, trusting in your abiding grace. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Share that peace with each other. As you came in, you should have received a little pre-sealed communion cup for each person who's communion. So I invite you to pull that out now and to go ahead and take off the top uh, cellophane, pull out the wafer, set that on your lap or on the seat beside you. And then if you'd like to go ahead and pull off that second uh, covering as well so that when we commune, you're all set to go. sisters and brothers, in the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, he gave thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat, this is my body given for you, do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and he gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin, do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom. Teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Christ has set this table with more than enough for all. So come. This is the body of Christ given for you. Given for you. Given for you. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. And as you finish up, you can put your empty cup there in the bowls at the end of your pew. Now may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Jesus, bread of life, we have received from your table more than we could ever ask. As you have nourished us in this meal, now strengthen us to love the world with your own own life. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, Well, there's not a whole lot of announcements uh, today at this point. Uh, We do still have choir on Wednesdays, so you join us for 6.30 choir outside. Um, I was wrong last week. I do this regularly. Just ask my wife. I'm wrong all the time. Very good. It's like my spiritual gift, being wrong. Uh, 
I said there was coffee hour today. There is not coffee hour today. It starts on uh, July 11th. So it being a holiday weekend, we figured people are ready to get going and get their barbecues fired up and everything. So no coffee hour uh, right after this worship service, but there will be next Sunday. And so Gary Dahlgaard is handling uh, all the preparations for that. So if you uh, want to participate in that, get a hold of Gary, uh, and I'm sure he would love some help with that. Um, while uh, Pastor Tim was preaching, of course, my, my millennial brain was hearing all sorts of entertainment. So he said, uh, let's see, he talked about the story of the boy who went to the NFL and came back home, and I was thinking, the boy is back in town, which is more like his age music, but you know, I knew the song. And then, uh, and then later he's talking about Paul on the road to Damascus. He says he's blinded by the light, and my head goes, blinded by the light, you know singing that. So I'm just singing these songs throughout. And then he said uh, he was the proclaimer and something. And the proclaimers, who I think was that Irish band, they went, I would walk 500 miles. So all throughout the sermon, I'm hearing all these songs. And then we finally got to sing. And so we got to sing the hymn of the day. So that was all nice. But um, I appreciate the, uh, the good sermon. It was good. Uh, he got to, uh, all that time with no cell phone service did him good for working on the sermon. So so I enjoyed, uh, enjoyed seeing you in worship today, and I hope you have a lovely rest of the day and uh, this whole week. And now I invite you to hear these words of blessing. The blessing of God who provides for us, feeds us, and journeys with us be upon you now and forever. Amen. Go in peace, you are the body of Christ. Thanks be to God.